Hello and welcome guys to another session. And today we are talking about the topic of lockless queue. Um, the lockless queue is a data structure where when there are multiple threads trying to operate, let's say to add to this queue or to pull data out of this queue, um, there needs to be some sort of synchronization and lockless queue is a concept where we don't have that overhead of uh, fighting for a lock and it uses some other constructs to resolve the conflicts between these uh, multiple threads. So today we're going to focus on um, this lockless mechanism and see how it comes into play and what kind of data structures sit behind this lockless mechanism. So like we said earlier, um, there are multiple producers and consumers um, in this situation because if there was only one producer or one consumer, you would not need a locking mechanism. Um, you would just simply be able to produce uh, a queue by advancing read and write uh, pointers or the head and tail pointers of this queue uh, without any trouble. So um, in this case, when there are multiple consumers and multiple producers, um, we have to deal with the concept of resolving the fact that who got in there first, because otherwise you'll end up with an incoherent state. And so these operations either require a lock or in this case, without a lock, what we do is we use special instructions, which are atomic. Um, these are atomic operations and um, they can be used by multiple producers or multiple consumers when they are trying to uh, advance pointers and that um, helps them resolve the conflict. Now, it does not mean that every instance of you trying that would succeed. You may have to spin on there depending on how many um, you know threads are in contention. You may have to wait there a little bit, um, but it would eventually resolve. Um, and so that's how this would work. So first um, thing is that we need atomic operations. And the second thing is by avoiding locks and lockless queues, we can improve performance by reducing the overhead associated with acquiring and releasing locks. Now, like I said, there's still some contention and you have to resolve contention, but we are able to do that without using um, a lock and a lock may be a little bit more expensive mechanism sometimes. So um, with that, let's look at the concept of this lockless queue. What are the data structures? What are the operations behind this? So in this case, um, this um, diagrams that I'm going to present are from um, DPDK, uh, Data Plane Development Kit uh, from Intel. And that provides this nice um, set of diagrams that explains it. And so I've um, used that um, flow and uh, the tutorial that is in DPDK. I will leave a, a link in my description so you can go and uh, read the full text if you wanted to. So with that, let's look at this um, data structure. So in the middle um, is this queue that we are operating on. And you can see that the consumer side, which is the read side, is sitting at object one. And the producer side is the next available free uh, entry, which is where the producers will stick the next um, object, right? So that is the original. And now just to distinguish what all, what are the players in this, um, in this um, algorithm. The first is the structure state, which is the overall state, despite, you know, in spite of all these threads, if you get rid of all these threads, there is a current state and that state is stored in the structure state. And so currently um, the, the consumer head and tail are st stuck on object, which is where the first object will be consumed, will be object one. And on the producer side, this is the first entry. Now let's take a look at the two threads that are in contention here. Local variables for core one. So these are the extra data structures that you need. And what you would do is that you would basically sample um, the tail um, of this data structure. So um, first of all, consumer tail is uh, provided here. So consumer tail is, is sampled here at the start of the operation. And the start of the operation is that these uh, two cores are trying to inject 
or these are producer cores and they are both are in contention. So take a look at the data structures that are sampled here. You get these two tails, you get the head, producer's head, right? You sample producer head. And you also have a producer next because you can inject one or more data entries. You have to calculate your producer next. Before you get in into this mechanism, you have to have all this, right? So the step one is to get all this, sample all this. And now that you have consumer tail, now you might ask, why do I need all this? Why do I need consumer tail? So the consumer tail is needed because this producer next should not be going past consumer tail, which means that you don't have enough space. And so that's why the consumer tail was sampled to make sure that I have enough space to accept this request. Producer head, as you will see in the next slide or so, um, are required to resolve contention. It, in fact, is the most important um, data structure here because this is what will tell the atomic operator that we actually succeeded in our request or we failed in our request. Um, so um, that is all for this slide. Let's move on. So in the next slide, this is where once we have all these data structures, now they request to add their data entry. So both cores are doing this. Now the first core, it actually, as we can see here, core one actually succeed, uh, um, core one actually succeeds and core two fails. Why is that? Because when they requested to inject um, the pointer, the head pointer, um, that operation is atomic, which means that core one said, check my head pointer if it matches the um, actual structure's head pointer, um, then um, advance it to my prod next, right? Uh, so, so what happened here was that since core one's instruction, atomic instruction was first, it succeeded because it when it checked prod head, prod head, remember in the previous slide, prod head used to be here. And so it checked first. And as soon as it matched on core one, it advanced the prod head right away. So now you look at it. So because it matched, it advanced the prod head. Now the next instruction went for core two and core two checked its prod head and its prod head did not match the previously sampled prod head. Now, this is obviously an advanced prod head, but remember, when you try to advance the pointers, you sampled and said prod head was supposed to be here. And so what you have to check is that what was supposed to be to what is currently there, if it's not the same, then your instruction has failed and you need to update. And so when that happened, core two then updates and says, this is my new new prod head. And it'll requeue that whole instruction again with this new prod head. At that point, you know, you will check and when you come in next time, you will try to match this um, against where the prod head is. And if it still is this prod head, then you can go in and skew and, and queue your, uh, or advance your pointer by accepting um, the entry. So um, in this case, what happened was that core one succeeded, so it moved the prod head and then core two failed and then core two again submitted its request um, because the prod head is now known and it's there, right? <clears throat> Next, now what happens is that um, core two now succeeds because it sees that the sampled prod head now matched the prod head that it tried to check here. Because remember, in the previous slide, uh, prod head was now here at the second free entry. And so when core two succeeds, it then matches that prod head, finds that the prod head sampled before is still the same, which means nobody has stolen it. And so it takes this object five as its um, location and it advances prod head at that point. So now we have seen how the prod head is checked using atomic compare and swap operation, right? And also we saw the, the use of the tail to make sure that we don't go past the tail in, as, we, as we add our data, right? So both of those things have taken place now. But um, another thing that has happened is that once your um, position once your atomic operation succeeds, you actually store your data here, right? And because you have won that pointer, you can go ahead and store your data there. The same thing happened for core two. Core two won the object five location, so it stored its data there. So all that has happened. And one more thing that has happened is that you have already moved prod head way past. So prod head is in the right location, which is the next free entry. 
and both cores have now succeeded. So what remains now? Um, what remains now is that we have to now move the prod tail, which is the um, this construct has to be moved because the tail is not in the right location. So now um, notice that this tail has already been moved by um, core one. And the way it works is that if you go back and see that at this point, the prod head and prod tail are matching which is the winning core. So when it won the object four and it was trying to write this object four, keep in mind that it also has the responsibility to advance prod tail. And you have to do that because that only when you advance prod tail that the consumer starts seeing that there is an extra data because if prod tail is pointing here, then only object three is valid, right? And it's not gonna, the consumer is not gonna read past object three. So when um, core one, wins the uh, atomic operation, it writes this object, and then because it is still, it's still the winning thing, because it's prod head and prod tail are matching, it goes ahead and advances prod tail forward, okay? So um, now that prod tail is here, now the core two is seeing that, oh, I'm, I have updated my object five, I'm gonna move prod tail, and that is true because its head is pointing to prod tail. So now it is, in the ownership of the prod tail, right? Um, core one is no longer in the ownership because its prod head and prod tail are not the same. So it cannot advance the prod tail anymore. It's lost that um, control. <clears throat> core two, however, is in control. It will advance the prod tail next to this last, uh, to the next prod head. And obviously it has stored object five at this point. And so once it advances prod tail, the operation is over. So that is the last step. Once the prod head and prod tail have both been advanced, we are done. And as you can see, the consumer can now see all the object four, object five, all the way up to this point because all these are valid. So there's no confusion between the consumer and the producer. And there was no confusion between producer on core zero, sorry, core one and producer on core two. They are both resolved in contention. Now, the use of uh, atomic operation was compare and swap. Compare and swap, uh, the way it worked was that, um, just go back quickly here um, to slide one, and you can see that the way you do compare and swap is that you first sample prod head, and when you request an operation, you make sure that you read it one more time and make sure that the sampled prod head and the prod head that you're about to read in atomic instruction are the same because this has to be like waterproof and there has to be just no way you can leak another um, transaction in there. So that's the way you do it. You first sample prod head and then you go ahead and issue your atomic instruction, which is one more time you're gonna read prod head and make sure that it's the same. If it's the same, that means nobody else has stolen it. And that's where you go ahead and advance it by saying, okay, I'm gonna move it to this location. So that is what happens on core one, that's how it wins, and that's how compare and swap um, makes this whole data structure on the producer side work correctly. Otherwise, it's not gonna work because you may or may not get, um, and both instructions may interfere with each other. So we are at the end of this. Now we have seen that um, we have succeeded in writing the data that we wanted to write, and we have not needed locks here. All we did was atomic instructions, and there was no need of a lock. So people may argue that, hey, still, you know, the instructions, the atomic instructions are, instructions are kind of a lock, but a lock is a more advanced data structure and it needs um, to be managed uh, across all these items. Whereas an atomic instruction is very simple. It just is doing something um, that happens in an atomic fashion and that's all that is needed. So it's in a way a simpler uh, construct compared to a lock. And so in this case, the performance may actually improve. And with that, we come to the end of this episode. If you liked the episode, please give us a like and or leave comments for us. And if you have not yet subscribed to my channel, please, please, please subscribe to my channel because that really helps me. And I will see you in another episode sometime later. Until then, take care and bye-bye.